guys, it's Kaylin, and I'm back at it again with another podcast. It's been quite a while since I have recorded an episode, and there are a lot of reasons for that. And I thought I would kind of tackle some of them in even more of an unstructured podcast than some of the other ones that I've done. I haven't really gone out of my way to really think about the things that I want to say or cover or talk about, and I thought that that would be kind of a more authentic approach to kind of what's in my head. Um, I'm not physically feeling my strongest, which always kind of it can go either way. Either I end up being a little bit more muddied in my thoughts, or it comes out a whole lot more transparent and authentic and clear, um, but you will notice that my voice sounds pretty pathetic, and there's nothing I can really do to change that. Um, but I think to start, um, since it has been so long, I feel like I owe at least a mild explanation in so much as this has been actually kind of legitimately difficult to do, um, to come back and record and to come up with thoughts and feelings and topics in part because to anybody who listened to the very, very first one of these that I tried, I was heavily, heavily inspired by Claire um, Wyland to be more authentic, to be more clear. My first podcast topic was on what it feels like to die and inspired heavily because of her own transparency about her feelings surrounding death and the inevitability of it and what it feels like to actually go through it and the emotional journey of all of that and It's something that I'm not unfamiliar with, and I don't know, I thought I could really bring some value into that conversation, and, you know, of course she was heading up for her double lung transplant not too far. She was kind of already thinking about it. It was in in her mind at that point, and um, at least as something to consider, and so to have that end as it did, it shook me to my core in a really profound way. Um, I have some updates on that in like the comment section of that podcast just to kind of explain some of my feelings a little bit more honestly and earnestly um, on how that affected me. Um, But death as a whole has always been very, very, very difficult for me Um, in every direction, some in the expected ways, others in the unexpected ways. And It's been a topic that's been incredibly heavy on my heart for the last few years, but it's something that's always been heavy on my heart for my entire life. So when events like that happen, it really, it just dredges up a lifetime's worth of emotions for me, and I often don't really know how to cope with them, and it takes me a really long time to sort through them, and to get the strength to kind of resume normalcy. Um, And I know that might sound a little strange, particularly in this instance, because while I've spoken to Claire and her mom and um, the foundation a few different times here and there throughout my life, and I've had a couple conversations with them through the internet, it's not like we were best friends. It's not like we knew each other face to face and, you know, like any of those kinds of things. But as anyone who knew Claire knew that she had such a profound impact on everybody. So having an ongoing friendship in person didn't really matter. It wasn't what really made that relationship rich. It wasn't what made her impact on others rich. Like, she just had the ability to do that for anybody, anywhere, any walk of life, chronic illness or not, experience with death or not, um... But also beyond that, like, this is just such a topic that is so raw for me and really, really intricately woven and stitched into who I am as a person. And it hasn't even been a year since I lost my best friend from childhood. And it's just been, it's just been tough. Um, Young people passing away older people passing away, my own mortality, things like that, like, they eventually kind of just can really, really weigh on you. And then earlier today, I have a friend who I've had for a very, very long time. We also kind of met through 
the YouTube space um, and people sharing their struggles and but she at least became a, a personal friend in real life and came back at it today to try to do the YouTube thing and be honest. Well, came back about a week ago, but then came in today and had another video and talked pretty frankly about her own experiences with just the, the fear of dying or the complicated feelings around death or just the overwhelming preoccupation with it. And... I could relate so much, it made me almost, like, physically nauseous, even though there was nothing upsetting. Like, there, it was just, just one of those things where you feel it so deep into your being that I'm like, this is, this is so me, and these are all the thoughts I've been having, and I've even articulated many of them on social media, but I've never really put them into words, and I certainly never considered doing it on this podcast, in part because it's not this all-accepting approach to death that I started this with. So it taps into some of the fears and the overwhelm and the negative feelings about it. And I started this kind of with a bit more of an openness to the topic and like a lack of fear. Or if nothing else, just a vigor for for living and fighting to live and all of those things. And it's that is all still incredibly true. That hasn't changed. If anything, I think I'm I'm still there in the determination to live after everything I've been through and even a lot of suicidal thinking in my lifetime. I've I've landed on the other side of it where I realize how okay it is to to want to fight for your life and to want to be here and to to not give up and not feel like you have to go with grace or accept that death is inevitable or accept that chronic illness is going to take us all eventually. So to just go quietly and peacefully and make it easy on everybody around you. Um, I still feel all of those things. Um, but there are still a lot of preoccupations that I have on the topic that are, they're just not quote unquote death positive. Um, but I don't think that they should be. I think we're all supposed to still maintain our or, I don't know, just like our struggling feelings around that topic. I don't think you, I mean, I think you can be more comfortable with the idea of death and face it more comfortably and, and talk about it and be authentic with your words and your thoughts and your heart and not have to hide it or um, shoo it away from everything in your friendships and your relationships on social media. Like, I don't think we should do that, but I think we also need to have the freedom to admit when things about it are upsetting or scary or that we don't want them to happen or we're confused or conflicted about faith or existential things or what this all means. Like, I think those topics should be allowed to be discussed freely too. Um, but I guess somewhere I've just decided that I don't, I don't want to admit to having as much of a wrestling complex that I've had with it. And so the combination of getting to just far enough in my healing from losing Claire and the all the topics that that brought up, um, all the other people in my life that I've lost, and being in the thick of a bunch of anniversary dates from close personal friends that I've lost this time of year, and then the video from Danny, who also really confronted how she's been very preoccupied with this. I don't know, I felt like, well, that's where I should start. I, I struggled for a bit on where I wanted to go with this, in part because I just didn't know what I wanted to talk about. It felt like a lot of the things I wanted to talk about just didn't go well with everything else that I had said thus far, or it just seemed like too much of a, a derail or, or a side conversation or unrelated, and I couldn't really get passionate about it. But this couldn't be more true to where I am right now, both physically, mentally, spiritually, all those things. So I thought I would walk through it and I think a lot of you might be able to relate. Um, I've just been very preoccupied with and fearful about kind of just death in general. Um, not necessarily my own, um, but it, as a, uh, just everyone in my life, but also my own. Um, I think I've always since I was also very young, I have always been heavily, heavily preoccupied with that topic. Um, I truly, to the core of my being, believed 
that I would never live very long. Like I'm talking as a very, very young child, I was sure that next week, next year, that was it. I remember, and I have explicit conversations embedded in my brain that I remember having conversations with siblings, and I think even a um, a close personal friend when I was like eight, I want to say, that I had like expressed how I was so lucky that I wasn't going to have to deal with the the nervous, embarrassing um, experience of having to shower after gym class in middle school, like you have to do, or you that we would have to do, or we thought we would have to do. And I thought that was so embarrassing. And I was just like, I expressed to them how, how lucky I was that I wouldn't have to do that because I was sure I wasn't going to live that long. And I, and I said it with so matter of factly and like, well, duh, there's no way I'm going to live that long. Um, even though everyone around me was older than that, it wasn't out of a place of, well, that's not possible or, or not understanding how life and death work or thinking that that's just so old. It was nothing about that. It was just me. I was just sure that I wasn't going to live that long. And yeah, I had a lot of trauma going on in my life and I had watched many, many other people die, but I didn't have a specific reason to think that my life specifically was going to be over by then. It wasn't like I was fighting a terminal illness. It wasn't like I had some major, major health complications as of yet that put that on my mind. I just was convinced of it. I, I I just was. And on one hand, I was oddly comfortable with that. I clearly just talked about it openly to people as if it was nothing. But I also had this fixation with it that was so unhealthy and so fear-based and traumatizing, truly and honestly, that it it scarred me for forever. When I think back to being that young and what was going through my mind then, I feel almost the same level of panic and terror. And I know a great amount of that was fueled by a lot of my OCD thinking and another big part of it by the religion, you could call it, um, others would call it a cult, uh, that I was raised in, that really, really honed down on the idea that the world would be ending very, 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 very soon, and that unless you were that faith, you wouldn't make it to heaven, um, or the new world, rather, and anybody else who wasn't that faith was gonna be obliterated, so both things really weighed heavily on me. I would look around at all of my friends who weren't the same faith as me and I would just get really upset and just start sobbing that they weren't going to make it and I didn't know how to save them and that we were going to miss each other and like just that would overwhelm me. Even in like first grade, I would just start breaking down crying one day out of nowhere about that. I, I felt safe, which is I guess in part why I thought some of this wasn't that big of a deal, but everyone around me wasn't, and I wasn't old enough to, to get them in, and I didn't, I hadn't been taught yet how to do that, so it wasn't even like I felt like I had some urgency to, to get them in, I was just acutely aware that they weren't going to make it, and was devastated by that, and even found myself distancing myself from friends, because I just couldn't handle how much pain that loss would cause me, I had also, from the time I was really, really young, um, like the first several years of my life, every grandparent and like close family person just kept dying in our family. Each consecutive year, a new family member would go, and my mom was the person in our family who was kind of sequestered away to take care of them. Um, And so we spent a lot of time with those family members in their final days and moments taking care of them because I was really young and my mom had to do that. And so I was around a lot and I had already demonstrated a lot of OCD symptoms since I was like three. Like I didn't know what that meant, but my family noticed that I did these repetitive behaviors and that I, I said things, I would repeat them, um, in, in a, in a unique way that none of their other kids had done. And then like by the time I was a little bit older and understood life a little bit more, I, you could, they could tell that I had these really, really irrational fears. And at a certain point though, I stopped telling people about them because they would look at me like I had six heads or 
Um, so I think they thought I just kind of went away, but in myself, in, in my own head, I was in my own personal hell, really fighting all of those things. And so I had this intense preoccupation with disease and with germs and especially cancer, since everyone in my family was just dying from cancer left and right and really irrational things, irrational things that could never, ever kill you. I was convinced that they would. And a lot of that didn't even have anything to do with faith stuff, which is, I know, an area that a lot of people with OCD can can get into, kind of, uh, well, if I do this, God's going to strike me down kind of thing. Um, I didn't even take that form or just germ form, um, which are the two more common ways to fear death. I, I thought really, really strange things. Like, I remember one day my sister and I came home and there was a like a yellow tablet on our table filled with notes that my mom must have been taking for her job and in a in like big bold letters it had said deadline on it and she had like gone over it several times and it was underlined really 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 thick and you know I was probably like seven I don't know six or seven and I had never I don't think anybody had given me the concept of a deadline like they may have told me when homework was due but didn't It's not like I knew what a deadline was. So I broke that word up into a compound word and it was like a dead line and it was underlined. And so I was convinced that if you touched that line, you were dead, like dead as a doornail dead. And my sister, I know, had reached for the tablet to slide it out of the way to just sit at the table. And I panicked. She didn't touch the line. She just was reaching towards that general direction and I flipped out. But then I was like, I can't tell her what I'm thinking because somewhere in my mind, I think I knew that that was irrational. I couldn't imagine my mom having the ability to construct a deadline. (laughs) Like she wasn't magic. She wasn't a witch. She wasn't some powerful being. So I think somewhere in my mind, I'm like, there's no way my mom just has this power to, to scribble lines on paper that have the ability to kill people. So I can't tell her that, but I was still so sure, like so sure. So like really, really bizarre things. And I would obsess on them over and over and over again. And I couldn't let go of that thought. I couldn't every day, every time at school, I would get overwhelmed with something new that I thought for sure was going to kill me. Things like as simple as getting stuck in a jacket when I was in preschool, even there was a jacket that the zipper wouldn't come up and down. And I was convinced that I was going to be stuck in the jacket forever and suffocate in it, even though I was wearing the jacket and I could breathe just fine with it, with it zippered. It wasn't until I knew that I, the zipper was stuck that suddenly I'm like, oh, it's going to suffocate me. I can't breathe. I'm going to die. And like, it wasn't even just like a typical little panic. It was like the thoughts that went with it, the, how much I wish I had said goodbye to people, the really hyper awareness of what other people in my life, how they would respond to me dying. Like it was really, really elaborate. It wasn't just panic about one thing. It was, it was so much more than that. And, um, I mean, in elementary school, things as simple as, you know, like if any water spots had been left on silverware in the cafeteria, like not even just food, just like water spots from it drying, I was convinced it was contaminated, and if I got one, I had to, I I would panic. Sometimes the panic would get so intense and come out of nowhere that I would just bolt, like I would run, like I I didn't know what to do with all of that overwhelm. And I know what some of you are probably thinking, yes, I'm aware that a lot of these symptoms are more than just OCD, but let's just ignore that for right now. (laughs) Yes, there are some behavioral things going on there and some... Some very literal thinking. I know, I know. Um, but I would just need to bolt and run because I didn't know what to do with all that energy and, and awareness. And I would be, like if I was in the cafeteria or a classroom, I didn't want all my classmates to see me die because I was so sure it was going to be instantaneous that I felt like I needed to protect them. So I would run out into the hallway or down the hallway or go somewhere to be alone, which... Now, as an adult, I'm thinking back how sad that is, how much my instinct was to go be alone to die instead of around people that I loved. But I 
had experienced, I think, enough death that I was just like, I don't want anyone to see that. I don't want that to be their last memory of me. And these are big, big thoughts for a seven or eight year old or even six. Um, and so it's always been on my mind and it didn't extend, it wasn't just for me. It often, it always extended into people of my family, pets, things like that. I was always super, super preoccupied with their health any emergencies. If they were late, I was sure that they were dead. Like all these very anxiety-based things, things that are not foreign to a lot of people. Many, 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 many people go through them. Um, It's not abnormal in the least. Some of it is not. The, The extreme to which I take it is definitely abnormal and very much not healthy and has always been there. I can't remember a time that it hasn't been there. And then I guess somewhere as I grew up, um, so my OCD thoughts took a different shape and by high school I had mostly started to get out of the faith slash cult that I was raised in and diverge from that and see that that was maybe not true. So some of, or at least the form that some of those irrational fears took started to shift. My OCD always kind of shifted. It would go from germs to organization to repetitions, to math problems, to, um, like, kind of like body dysmorphia, body checking, not even things to do with weight, um, but like really obsessive picking or measuring or, um, I don't know, things like that. So like, I would go in really, really sharp phases with my OCD. So some of it, or at least the fear about death specifically or disease, taking over had kind of backed off for a little while there. And I think somewhere in high school then also, by then I was very, very immersed in my eating disorder. So of course, those obsessive thoughts really channeled themselves into that. And then almost became this, the opposite. I felt invincible at times. Like I was doing all of these things that made other people violently ill very, very quickly. Others who I met in treatment were often not as sick as me, but were in much worse physical health. Like their behaviors weren't as um, obscene as mine. Sometimes their weights weren't as as crazy, but their physical health was worse. Um, Like they had more complications. And in my disordered brain, I thought that made me somehow invincible to death. Like... I'm doing all of these things that should have written my ticket a long, long, long time ago, but for whatever reason, I don't seem to have complications like everyone else does. And then that eventually channeled itself into just almost like a suicide mission in a similar way that I never got in trouble in school, ever, to the point that when I started to do things that I thought I should have gotten in trouble for and no one no one at all even seemed bothered or phased. Like, I wasn't punished ever. It almost made me want to just start pushing the the boundaries just so that someone would finally get me in trouble, like, to, just for fairness, for justice. Like, so it was almost similar with death. It was like I was doing all these things that warranted that, and it didn't happen. Well, now I'm just, like, so annoyed by that, that I'm going to push the boundaries and I'm just going to go seeking it now. But I was also heavily, heavily depressed and I genuinely just didn't care anymore. And I was really jaded by faith stuff and felt like I'd been really grossly misled by all of that. And I just, I just didn't want to be here anymore. And so then my, my temporary invincibility then turned into like a a complete absence of fear of death, like to where I'm literally seeking it. I find it thrilling to seek it. I don't care at all. I'm not afraid of it. I'm not concerned with it. I know it's coming. The only things that I was semi-concerned of was how other people would be affected by it. But even then, in my mental illness, I just, even, I stopped having the capacity to care about that too much. I almost felt like the longer I lived, the worse I was going to hurt people anyway, um, in the loss. So, that should just happen. Also, by then, I had lost several friends um, my age to car accidents, suicides, things like that. Um, 
and everything just looked so bleak and I had lived so much longer than I thought I ever would have as a kid that I'm just like I don't care anymore like I'm I'm okay with this here we go and as I know some of you heard from one of my first podcasts I you know almost made good on that mission um and in the moment I didn't care I was I didn't have that fight I didn't try to fight I didn't I I really genuinely and authentically just surrendered and somehow again my body pulled through and I was angry about it initially because I'd set my sights on this one thing and I just hoped that it would be over and then it wasn't and Now I had to deal and live with those consequences that I had created for myself and all of the pain that I had caused other people and suddenly was supposed to find this will to live and to, and in order to go to treatment, you have to really, really work hard. And if you're not in a place where you even want to be alive, finding the the vigor inside to want to put in that effort for treatment is basically impossible. And I, I don't know, I found that very upsetting. But eventually I got through that, or, or like at least that, I don't know, that mentality. Found a way to push through that. I think I had also lost several other friends in the next two to three years. Um, some to mostly due to some more car accidents, a couple other suicides, another very close to me, um, trying to be as untriggering and non-graphic as I can be, but, um, I had just so much death in my 19th and 20th year of life that, and they were all so young, um, that initially it really just depressed me and I just felt like I was swimming and drowning in death and funerals and like I couldn't see anything else but at some point I realized I should at least try um I don't want to do this to other people then I started to get angry in the other direction where I was like death is such a jerk and it causes so much pain and suffering and particularly death by suicide it is so cruel to the people that it leaves behind. It leaves them with all these unending answers and this sense of guilt and this relentless, like it's, the book never closes. There are some from, again, when I was a teenager, I still ruminate on them. I still try to figure out what was going on for them, what I could have seen, done, known, even though I know from my own experiences that that's, you, those are, those questions are futile. They, they aren't going to get you anywhere. Um, but I can't help it. Whereas with car accidents and things like that I I know rough I I have enough of an answer I know what happened um it's kind of finite and I can kind of let them go um so I got kind of angry at that idea and I didn't want to do that to other people so I'm like well at least put in the work at least give life a try at least try to make relationships and connect with people again I kind of had isolated myself in so far from other people that the desire to live, of course, wasn't going to be th- be there because I had shut myself in from what makes life worth living and the connections to people and the meaningful experiences and excursions. And it's unfortunate that somewhere around this time is also when I got even closer to my childhood best friend. Um, his name is Cole. Um, we reconnected even tighter. I mean, we never lost connection, but you know, kind of just life sort of carries you in different directions, particularly since I was in treatment all the time and away for months at a time. It was very easy to, to not really be in close, close relationship to high school and elementary school best friends and stuff like that. So now I was in a place where I wanted that again and connected with him And we had lots of adventures, like things that just made me so excited and vigorous to be alive again. Um, And then, of course, as per usual, life happens and some other really traumatic things happened. And I kind of found myself in that same place that I was when I was a teenager, where I was just kind of on my own. I wouldn't say I was quite on a mission, but I was just aware that, like, I couldn't bear this pain anymore. So I'm going to do every reckless behavior I can think of. And if it happens, it happens. Oh, well. Um, in my mind, I was kind of seeking it. I was being reckless enough to seek death. Um, but I didn't, like, actively, intentionally 
set out a plan to do that. Um, I was more so tackling it from the perspective of this is too much to bear. If I accidentally go, oh well, but I'm going to use all of these vices in an attempt to hold me over until I want to live again. I'd, I'd found that ability before. I knew that if I could just find a vice that could get me through, one day I might want to be here again. As long as it can just hold off on that pain in that interim, I'll find my will and then I'll straighten myself out, which did end up happening. Surprisingly enough, it did. And in part, it was due to having my friend Cole along. Um, there's a big misconception that addiction is just about chemical dependency and trauma, but it's also about isolation and walling yourself off from all of the things that make life worth living or make you want to try and make you want to fight. And though he and I were both lost in addiction together, we had so many excursions and just fun impromptu moments and connections with each other and heart to hearts and music and did a lot of things sober together too. It wasn't just um, using substances for that time being. We had a lot of those and it gave me that, that vigor again, that desire to always experience those things in a sober and healthy place. And so again, I cleaned up. It wasn't actually that hard once I wanted to clean up and it wasn't that long. I didn't spend that long there. It was only, it was less than a year. Um, it was a brutal year, but it was less than a year. And then I found my way. And truthfully, since then, my life has really only gone in a much more dramatic upward tre trend mentally since then. Um, and that was eight years ago. Um, but in that time, I found my will to live more. I put in the work. I established more relationships with people. I, I don't know. I feel like I just felt healthier about a lot of things. So some of my preoccupation with death had subsided and I didn't have reminders everywhere. Um, the people in my life were also not dying at accelerated paces and I just felt so much more connected with what it means to be alive and I had never felt that ever in my life. So somewhere between like the ages of probably 23 and a half or so to like 28, I want to say, were very much a exploratory time of life and trying to have relationships and meet new people and um, really just be a person and feel more invincible in a good way and, and really be alive. Um, my health wasn't great then, but I had still put in that time. So some of those preoccupations had, had fallen away for me a little bit. Um, but then in the last few years here, everyone and really important people just keep dying around me again. Um, if you didn't know, there's probably, I think we counted one time, it's like 22 people in my life or something like that have, have died. And many of them were very, very close. It's an absurd number. It seems inhuman. I know. Um, and that's not even counting my trauma experiences that I saw where they were acquaintances, but I didn't know them. <clears throat> um, it's just been a life filled with that. Um, so in the last couple of years, I've lost several friends again, some of them to drug overdoses, of course, friends that you make when you're using, you always run that risk that that's kind of just what's going to happen to some of them, to a handful of them. And it did for some, um, some others had car accidents, some others had some chronic health issues. Um, and then there are some things in my trauma world that I haven't really ever talked about or explained, and I, I really can't. But I would say that those are really what were the big tipping point for me to, to wind up back in this preoccupation. And I just, it's like everywhere I look, people are just dying. And I spent most of my teenage years and early 20s terrified to pick up the phone because every single time I picked up the phone, one of my close friends was telling me that somebody else really important had died or that their parents had died. And it was like I was terrified to ever get a phone call from anyone, especially if I cared about that person. It just meant that something horrible had happened. And so by my mid-20s or so, I had finally gotten comfortable enough to pick up the phone again, to have relationships with people, to meet up with them, to, to keep in contact, to check on them, to to really bond and get close. And then by late 20s, everyone just started dying again. And 
my own health was also in that same place. And it's like I just couldn't get out of that headspace. And I feel like I haven't been able to for at least two years. I feel like I can't leave it. Like I'm, especially because, you know, like I said, last year Cole, who I've been talking about, died pretty suddenly. And Claire, of course, passed away. A friend, Mark, passed away. Jordan, um, a friend of my mom's, Papa Z, another friend, Derek. Like, everyone just kept dying. And then these really, really close, important people that I can't share much about because it's private. Um, I just... I, I feel like I haven't been able to get off that topic and... <clears throat> excuse me, my own health has really pushed me to that brink a lot of times. But I have, in the last few years, you know, of course, I'm fainting all of the time. I've had really dangerous arrhythmias. I've been in and out of the ER a lot. My blood pressure gets extremely low and my rhythms are abnormal. Some of my health issues are actually not that well explained by some of my other conditions. So there are still question marks sometimes. As to what I have, I have some markers of what look like vascular EDS. It's probably not that, just because mine are more subtle. But they're still there enough, and that's a very fatal form of EDS. And it's like this constant fear of, I'm always checking my body and my symptoms and being like, is this a stroke? Am I having a stroke? Okay, no. Okay, is it an aneurysm? Did one of my blood vessels burst? Is that a possibility? Is this going to be a heart attack or my rhythm's going to get off? Like, what is the symptom? Okay, I can't breathe. Is this anaphylaxis? Am I going to... I'm just constantly having to do a body assessment even because while some of my symptoms are quote-unquote normal, when it gets to a place where even I have never felt that sensation before, I have to panic because my body's always in a, in a state where healthy people would be concerned for their well-being because it's not supposed to behave this way. So when I experience symptoms I've never experienced before, I have to take them very, very, very seriously and do that kind of inventory and self-check. And, you know, you end up in the ER enough times with, with real complications and it's impossible not to just feel like every day is just a mortality check. You just have to always remind yourself that you're not invisible and that this can happen at any moment and just hope that you get 10, 20, 30, 40 more years out of this life, but also being humbled by the fact it could happen at any moment, any day, and not even necessarily from chronic illness, just from a car accident or some other um, natural disaster or just a random act of, I don't know, something, something dramatic, um, an accident, any of those kinds of things. And when enough people in your life have been dying, it's really hard to get that off your mind. I find myself back in that place where just riding in a car with my mom, suddenly it will become on my mind that we could just lose control or someone could hit us or whatever. And my mind will walk through all the steps really fast, like a blink of an eye. And Usually when I think of that, I don't think about my own health. I think about my mom. And I don't have close relationships with my family, but my mom is one of them. And they're, of course, I'm 31, so they're going to get older. And the reality that they're going to experience health complications or pass away for whatever reason is just growing expon exponentially more probable. I have lots of friends who have lost their parents. Like, we're just getting at that age where... <clears throat> You recognize that this is a thing and that this can happen any time, any day. And it's always been there. But it's like oppressive and it's intrusive and it's a preoccupation I cannot seem to let go of. And I find it especially difficult when I'm in the car. But even when my mom is very, very tired and leaves my apartment, she only lives a few minutes away from me, but she leaves my apartment to go home. If I hear sirens, even 15 minutes later, I know that she should have been home by then, but I'm like, yeah, but if she wrecked, it would have taken a while for them to get there. And like, I can't let those thoughts go. And if she doesn't respond to my texts, I start panicking dramatically. And it's not even like, a, like the experience of just like anxiety. It's like true panic. It's like planning. It's, it's like a panic where it doesn't like on the outside, it wouldn't look like I'm panicking. 
it's like my default trauma response of like, okay, I'm panicking because I'm terrified, but my response to panic is to be almost calm in a crisis, which sounds completely counterintuitive. Like they shouldn't exist together, but like I'm, my alarm, my brain is panicking, but my body is just in planning mode. And who do I call? Who do I need to reach? Who do I need to speak to? Um, how can we take care of this? But my emotions are also still losing their mind and are so convinced that I just get so convinced so quickly that something had to happen. And it's not this open-ended question of, did something happen? Is something wrong? It's more like, okay, this happened. What do I do next? Which is a terrible way to live because I'm I'm constantly convincing myself that healthy people are no longer here or that healthy people are at risk. And then when they, when I find out they are okay, then I have to remind myself they're okay. They're well. Check on them. Experience life. Connect with them. Don't push them away. Be there for them. Um, Which is a really hard thing to do because when you're constantly in this push-pull tug of war of thinking that people that really mean a lot to you are gonna die or they did die and you have to remind yourself that they're still here, it makes maintaining a relationship with them really really hard because our instinct is to protect ourselves and to guard our hearts from all of this insultly just indescribable pain and so I often want to push them away and um just just because I need a break because almost just like seeing them and remembering that they're alive I'm just constantly focused on their mortality and like I can't I just I can't be present like I want to be which is extremely frustrating especially as someone who has found a desire to live I want to be here for one of the first times in my life I don't have this impending guarantee that I'm going to be gone soon, though I worry that it could. Like, I'm just in a different headspace than I am. So if anything, the pressure to want to be present and engaged and in the here and now and aware that this is precious and every moment, my, my talking to you right now is a precious connection. Like, I want to be so aware of that all the time. And I often am to the point that it drives me mad. So then the flip side of that is to just shut it all down, to block it all out, block everybody out, block every, like, I can't, like, I can't, you cannot live in that constant state of awareness of, of yours and everyone around you's mortality. Like, you, you'll drive yourself mad if the pressure that you face to make the most of every moment and to be present in every moment, like, the mind is just not able to do that. And for someone like myself who has, like, a lot of sensory troubles and ADHD and OCD, like, all of these mental illnesses combined, being that acutely attentive to things is literally going to drive me mad. Like, I can't, I will start obsessing, I will start, I will get into hyper-focus mode, but I will also be so overstimulated by how important it is and how precious the moment is and wanting to be engaged and take in every sense and experience in the sky and the birds and the ground and the marvels of human history and the marvels of this moment and like all of it, like it's just too many details and they feel so important that I don't miss one of them that in the end I just drive myself bonkers. And so then I shut off and oftentimes we'll get really dissociated and tune it all out. And it's like, I'm just constantly vacillating between these very, very two big extremes. And I found that incredibly difficult. And um, especially with the people in my life, I don't have many anymore. Um, Mostly just because of health stuff has kind of pushed me there. But I'm often still afraid to connect with new people because it's just one more, another relationship to worry about losing I'm always worried about signing onto Facebook who's going to be the next friend of mine whom we're having a memorial for. Um, my therapist, ha- I'm constantly worried something has happened to her. Um, she has a daughter who's also not well at the moment, and even though we have boundaries and healthy boundaries, and I shouldn't know much about her family and try very, very hard not to ask those questions and to keep that private. It's, it's hard to have this unanswered thing, so sometimes I'll have to check in and just see how that's going, just because I cannot let it go. I, I have a really hard time, like, especially because she's young, um, and even though, again, boundaries, and it shouldn't be about that, and it should only be about me, and I shouldn't be worried about... I know all those things, but that does... I'm still a human being, 
and this we're all just humans yes she's got a job and a profession and i'm the patient and she's the clinician and these are these con- constructs that we've made but we're just human beings we're just alive we're both all just trying to do the best that we can we all just care about our families and we care about each other and i've known her since i was 18 like it's just it's natural it's going to happen and i've found a place where i can accept that that's okay and not just shame myself or be like you shouldn't even be thinking about that or worrying about that boundaries 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 and um that this is wrong it's not wrong it's not wrong to worry about the human condition and what others are going through and how hard this might be for someone and how much you might even relate to them like that's just so human and so natural and so organic and some of these lines that we've had to draw almost make that harder um so I've given myself the freedom to have that but of course because I'm not of the most sound of mind and my own health and my own risks with death constantly remind me of how scary that is and how overwhelming that is then that gets projected onto the other people that I'm thinking about and worried about and connecting with and it just heightens the experience to to where I really get how how tumultuous this might be for them and I don't know. I'm I'm in a a weird place. I mean, heck, every time I go to sleep at night, my blood pressure and stuff like that gets incredibly, incredibly low. And I have a million arrhythmias and my body behaves very, very, very strangely every single time I lay down to go to sleep. And I have to constantly do a self-assessment of, is this an emergency or is this not every night? And it's not just my anxiety and it's not just paranoia. This is actually based in reality. This is my realism kicking in. And to be in that place is so distressing and I can't get any sleep, which just weakens my body. But then also my body itself is also aware that it isn't well. And when my heart rate gets too like too low, if I start drifting or even if I'm asleep, if it gets too low, in a similar way that your body believes that you're dying when you start to drift off to sleep and it starts to, to shut off into the automatic functions of the body only... It, that's why a lot of people feel like they're falling off a cliff or jumping like that experience is to like startle you awake and remind your body just needs to remember like oh no we're still alive we're good we're good we're good we're not dying all right awesome in a similar way my body does a very similar thing even if I'm already asleep or as I start to fall asleep or even if I'm just laying laying down I haven't even started to drift yet like if my heart rate and my body gets too low it's like my body just spazzes really quick and like races and panics and like sends a flood of adrenaline through my body because it's like we can't die we can't die we almost died we can't do this like it just and so then of course that's just a biologic response so my mental response to that is to be temporarily panicked and be like well what happened what's wrong with me what am i going through something is this an emergency because my body is behaving like it is one when it's really not and then of course you get used to that and you, you know, I'm so used to that now that I can talk myself out of it and be like, this happens all the time. It's no big deal. But then you worry, have to worry about becoming so used to it that you miss the, the times that it's actually an emergency. And because that is happening every night, I'm just never able to get out of this headspace that is constantly preoccupied with death and life and what it means to be alive and how important it is and how much the people in my life mean something to me and how much life means something to me and the how precious everything is and how much of a wild bizarre miracle that it even is that we have the shapes that we do the bodies we do the cellular structures and hearts and lungs and the way that molecules create oxygen, which feed the brain, which feed the blood with like this whole intricate system. Like it just mesmerizes me and I can't sometimes just click out of that and just be present and be like, hi, I'm a human being. Let's enjoy our time together as friends over coffee. Let's just have fun and joke about Twitter or joke about some, what some YouTuber did or what your kids did. Like to me, everything is so much more important than that, that I have a really hard time just clicking off sometimes and finding that middle ground. Like, I'm just like, when I spend time with people, especially family or friends, or especially during the holidays, or now that I have a a niece who is very young, and she's, you know, she only just had her first birthday. Like, I'm around these, like, mini miracles, as far as I'm concerned. And everyone else, it's just like a little play date, or a little visit, or um, my mom coming over to help me clean my house or, 
Um, that's all it is to them. It's just like another chore on the list or another thing to check off or an appointment to get through or a scheduled visit. But to me, it's like, these are so precious. These are such a big deal. You have no idea how a big of a deal this is. You don't even know how miraculous it is that you got through the probability of a car accident on your way over here, that, that you escaped this germ and this whatever. And like, all these statistics are constantly in my brain. And I'm like, you're not even, everyone else around me is just so blissfully unaware of these things and just living, but it's so much healthier also. Like, it's not a good thing. But there are times that I wish that sometimes they understood how important and how meaningful and how special some of the moments were together and how um, important it is to love the people around you as deeply and passionately as you can, to let them know you love them and that you care, to reach out, to do those things. Because I cannot tell you how suffocating and exhausting and devastating and crushing it is to lose that opportunity. And to have not seen it coming. And for myself, I had put Cole at an arm's length because he was too unwell. And he's my best friend for my whole life. And to just wake up one day and realize that's gone. Even as someone who was already aware of how precious life was and who went out of their way to express my compassion and my love and my connection to people. I did all those things and I still cannot bear what it feels like to lose that one day and it's final it's not coming back they're not just taking a nap they're not just taking a trip away they aren't just in the hot they're it's forever absolutely forever it will never change and i'm just i'm so aware of that all the time And it can be upsetting to me sometimes that the people in my life are not aware of that. I just want to shake them sometimes and be like, you don't understand how big of a deal this is. You don't understand how important this is. You're not respecting the people in your life and one day they won't be here. Particularly for those who have not experienced much death in their life. But you can't wake someone else up. They have to find that on their own. But you just know that the time and the experience that wakes them up is going to be brutal. And I don't want that for them. But I also don't want them to live in this madness space that I'm living in. This isn't healthy either. This preoccupation isn't good. It It is taking away my opportunity to connect more richly and consistently because I just get so burnt out. One visit and I feel like I've used up all of my love and compassion and connection and what it, for in an, in an hour that I should have had dispersed over a year because it just means that much to me. And that's it's an intense way to live, and it's it's intense for other people, and I don't know, it's it's hard. And so even things like this, like making a podcast and trying to make a difference in people's lives and really reach out to them and do my advocacy online, on Twitter, on Instagram, and on these different places, um, I just it just feels so important and such a big deal to me. But you can't communicate that to other people sometimes, and especially not in words. And so I just get so overwhelmed by it and overstimulated by it that I shut down. My body is not healthy enough to, to be that on and that aware. And it's, it's a lot. Um, so I hope in sharing that, either you could relate some way or took something out of it or could share your experiences with me or... Um, how you've gotten through some of these things or um, just your own relationship with the topic, whether it be about your own mortality, people in your life, people you've lost. Did it fade? Did it wax and wane for you like it did for me where I went through such massive spells of I'm not afraid to die to now I'm going to go seeking it to now I'm apathetic to I'm invincible to life is now the most important thing ever and I need to live it super fully and that I don't want to die and I'm scared of that and like right now I'm not scared of dying like that like the process of it doesn't worry me and I'm not even that focused on what happens after it's just this acute awareness of what I'm losing and who I'm missing and what it will do to the people in my life who just like me have to wake up one day and find out that the person they cared about isn't there anymore 
I don't want to put people through that, and yet I don't get a say. Not this time. I don't want to do that to them. But it's also so much more sad to to fade away and have not had that connection all that time. Those that that gap that I didn't have with Cole, I will never not regret that gap and that distance that we had. That hurts worse than if we had been super super close and then suddenly he just went. <laughs> So, share with me what you're going through. I'm sorry, I'm so tired and very emotional and I'm just weary. My heart is weary, my head is weary, my body is very weary. It's a lot. This is what it means to be human. This is what it means to be alive, to hurt, to feel, to love, to connect, to be sick, to overcome sickness to to be mentally unwell to be working through it and being honest with yourself and working through those things to finding a way to the other side to to reaching out to you it's it's all of these things i hope it brought you something i'm thinking of all of you even though it's just a few of you for now Hopefully somebody will stumble upon this even years down the road and take something from it, and I take comfort in that idea. (laughs) Okay, take care of yourselves, and I will talk to you hopefully sooner than later. Alright, bye-bye.